Thank you, Pastor Mike. It's good to be a part of God's family. We're going to be in Matthew this morning. Could you please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 as we continue. We're going to be wrapping up this uh, series on the Sermon on the Mount, the sayings of Jesus, his teachings from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. This morning we're going to be in verse 24 to 29. And the context of this passage is that we would not just be doers of God's words, or hearers of God's words, but doers. That we would practice, put His words into practice. One second here as I get my notes. Reading from verse 24. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 7, verse 24. The Word of God says, Therefore, everyone, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Verse 26 says, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. As the chapter sums up in verse 28 and 29, the word says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed. Some verses say astonished. Some versions say astonished. They were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Lord, today, again, we join together as one body, one unit with many parts. Thank you for the gifts you've given us in this body. Thank you that you are the head. We look to you, our Lord, our Master, and our Savior, and the King of Kings. We look to you this morning, Lord, and we do gather around your footstool as we read earlier. We gather around your footstools and we fix our eyes upon you. We ask you to teach us from those very words that are yours. May our eyes be open, may our ears be open to see and to hear and to know you even more during this hour that belongs to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to share with you the story, the true story that happened. He's just passed away recently. Theologian and Pastor R.C. Sproul was a well-known, well-known Bible teacher and, and quite an amazing Bible teacher. But I remember him telling the story when he was a young, young minister, a young professor. He was being considered as an applicant to be a professor at a Bible college. And he uh, had to go through the interview process. So in the initial interview process, as they were screening applicants, he was uh, asked this question. Uh, This specifically, and, and I'm quoting, this is his quote. He said, he was asked by the college, by the interview panel, can you make the word of God come alive? We need someone young, and exciting, someone with a dynamic method who will be able to make the Bible come alive. He had a long pause, and in his few seconds, he had in his thought process, this he shares his thoughts. He said, he thought to himself, wait a minute, 
You want me to make the Bible come alive? I didn't know it had died. In fact, I never even heard that it was ill. The question he was asking his mind to the interview panel was, who was the attending physician when the Bible was ill or when the Bible was dying? Who was the attending physician at the Bible's demise? But he ended up saying to the interview panel, no. This is his words. No, I cannot make the Bible come alive. The Bible is already alive. In fact, he said, it makes me come alive. It's one of the most profound things about the Word of God I've ever heard. It's one of my favorite quotes. No, I cannot make the Bible come alive. For anyone, the Bible is already alive. It makes me come alive. And that word, because it's dynamic and it's living, it's eternal, and, and, and I will put it this way. It's breathing. The Word of God is breathing. It's alive. It became flesh and dwelt among us. It tabernacled among us. Jesus is the Word. He is alive. He's resurrected. But the Word of God is always uh, everlasting. Now last week we talked about knowing a tree by its fruit. Jesus said, this is how you will ultimately know Someone, if they're not a false prophet or if they're a true teacher of God's Word. And of course, he was contrasting the teachers of those days, the religious leaders, who were, a lot of them were false prophets. And they taught God's Word wrongly and they interpreted it wrongly and they applied it wrongly. But Jesus said, you will ultimately know a tree, not by its bark, not by its leaves, but by its fruit. Now, some of us know trees very well, as I shared last week. We might know this looks like this looks like a sycamore tree, but when we see the leaf, yeah, I think that's a sycamore tree. But it's when the fruit appears that it confirms what that tree actually is. Is it is a good tree, or is it a bad tree? And we mentioned that the key, the key to the fruit, is the root, what you don't see. And it's the same thing, the same principle of the kingdom is now being applied to how we build our houses. When you see a house, when you see, I mean, you look out the window, I can see my apartment at Shindo. 20 stories, we see this great, I mean, Shindo takes up like a city block, it's huge. But what you don't see is the foundation. The key to that building, for it to stand 20 stories high in the air, is the foundation. And that's what Jesus is teaching in this final word in the Sermon on the Mount. You will know a tree by its fruit, and you also will know a house by how it can withstand when the storm comes because of the foundation that was laid before the building was built. This passage of Scripture, this verse, these verses begin with the word, therefore. It's a very important word when it comes to Bible context and understanding uh, the full context of what's being said. Now, up until this point, Jesus has been talking about the main theme. For the last several weeks, we've been discussing this. Pastor Mike mentioned it again recently, that the theme of these three chapters, 5, 6, and 7, is the kingdom of God. And, And those people in the first century, they had a glimpse of it when Jesus came. He told them to repent for the kingdom of God was near. He brought the kingdom with him. And they they saw a glimpse of it. But also the kingdom is the future. We have not fully actualized. We have not fully seen or or we have not uh, seen the full demonstration of the kingdom of God. It's something yet to take place. And yet, this is what he taught about primarily in this sermon. The kingdom of God is all about God's reign and rule in our lives. And so when he is on the throne of our hearts, church, there will be an outcome. There will be a result. There will be fruit. And that's what he's saying here. So whenever you see the word, therefore, it's a good reminder for us that we have good, sound, biblical interpretation and study principles, good methods. 
of studying the Bible. You must always look. Anytime you see the word therefore or thus or then or so, you must look at the preceding verses and sometimes even chapters so you get the whole context. In other words, Jesus is saying this is the culmination now. It's all being brought together in his final last words of the Sermon on the Mount. So the word therefore, it marks the transition from what is said and what the results or the consequences are of what has been said. So those little words, like so and therefore and thus, they're actually very, very important words. And uh, Jesus is the one now given the, the interpretation, the proper interpretation, because he is the Messiah and he is the living word. So he's saying, therefore, or consequently, if you, if you listen to my words, these words of mine, but not just listen to them, but to live them out because they are living words, there's going to be some good results. There's going to be some good expected outcomes. Everyone who hears these words of mine, you see a believer, many people have different definitions of what a believer is or what a Christian is. The word Christian has been somewhat corrupted now by modern society. It's been diluted. It's been polluted. Sometimes now Christian just means you were born in your, somewhere in Europe and that's your, that's your, uh, your, your ancestors were there and they were Christians and you were born a Christian. But, a, but a, a true believer church is someone who hears the word of God. They actually hear it and they accept the word of God. And they recognize that these words, these are the words of God. These are the words of eternity. These are the bread of life. As Peter said, to Jesus in John chapter 6 when, when many people stopped following Jesus because he taught them about his body and his flesh and his blood uh, saying that his body would be broken and his, his blood would be poured out and he wanted them to have communion by partaking in his body his broken body and his blood which is the wine that we take or the juice that we take during communion and, he, and some of the people stopped following Jesus and Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, do you want to stop following me also? And he said, Lord, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. These words of mine. It's a very uh, important statement for us. Have you ever heard the expression when someone, maybe they've been in an argument or maybe they've been misquoted and someone will say, don't put words in my mouth. I remember early in my marriage, I think that happened to me a couple times. I misunderstood my wife and my wife said, don't put words in my mouth. Why? Because I was trying to win the argument. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Trying to win the argument. Don't put words in my mouth. The same principle applies as well that we should never, never, please listen to me, we should never put words in God's mouth. In fact, the Bible warns us about adding and taking away from the word of God. These words, he says, these words of mine. I want to encourage us to really think about that this week. To reflect on it. To treasure it. To ponder it. And to, to let that seed be deep rooted into our hearts. That it's his words. The words from above. Because the contrast here we'll see in a few minutes. But if we put words in God's mouth, then we are living out and looking like the religious leaders and the Pharisees of the first century. They replaced God's words and God's ways and God's will and even God's wisdom with their own. And that's why Jesus now has corrected them, these religious leaders, and he's told his followers, yes, you need to obey them, but don't do what they do. They do not provide a good uh, pattern. They do not provide a good example, a good model. And they don't put into practice the words of God. And this is what differentiates us from the world. So he says, therefore, these words of mine, put them into practice. Now, some older translations and versions will say to do what it says. 
That's a very basic way of saying it. But in the modern English, we use the word practice. Put them into practice, them being the very words of God. So a believer church is someone who hears the word of God, someone who accepts it, but we can't leave out the third part. A believer is someone who obeys the word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And if you obey me, it means you love me. It's inseparable. Now, he's not talking about that we're perfect. He's not saying that we won't fail. Just like the song we sang, Come Thou Found Every Blessing. Robert Robinson, who wrote that hymn, he himself was a backslider. He fell away from faith in God. And it is in the midst of being returned back to the Lord in his relationship that he wrote that song. That's why you see the words, prone to wander. He, was, he fell astray. He left the flock, but God brought him back. So a believer hears the word of God, accepts the word of God, and obeys the word of God. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. But it does mean you have a pattern and a practice and a heart and a desire to obey the word of God. Think about it. What got the world into this big mess that we're in? The world needs to be repaired. The world is disintegrating. The world is fractured. The, and it all started by an act of disobedience in the Garden of Eden. The word to put means to set God's teachings into place. In other words, have them written in your heart. Have them written in your mind. The word practice, when you think about it, it means, uh, it does mean to rehearse, but it also means to execute and to put it into action. Now think about it. If you were on a baseball team or a basketball team or volleyball team, what if all you ever did was practice or soccer team or worship team? What if the only thing you ever did was rehearse and you never actually got to do it? That actually happened during COVID. A lot of teams, whatever it is, professional teams, college teams, they practice, they practice, and they practice, and they never got to actually play the game. Jesus is saying to let the Word of God to be sown into your heart as a seed and to live it out and to practice it and to execute it into action. That's why it said a physician practices medicine. A doctor practices medicine. The root word of medicine or medication or meditation is the word medi, and it means a cure, a remedy to help someone to be cured. And that's what a doctor does. A doctor practices medicine. And why is it that we're supposed to put this word into practice? Well, because it's living. It's the living word of God. As I said before, it's breathing and it's eternal. Now, please notice something that Jesus did not say. He did not say this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and memorizes them only is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. No, he said, put it into practice. Now, as a Bible teacher, we just recently, in the last week, we awarded several awards to students for Bible memorization. Several students. Some of them absolutely 100% perfect. Verbatim, word for word. For the whole semester, some of them for the whole year, they memorize. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not just about memorization only. We have to apply the word. In fact, the Pharisees and especially the scribes, the teachers of religion in Jesus' day, they could actually memorize the entire Old Testament, all 39 books. They had it memorized, many of them. But if they don't put it into a practice, then it's like the foolish person who built their home upon, uh, upon the sand. So he wants us to uh, not just to hear the word, not just to accept it, but to obey it and to put it into practice. So when we practice God's word, it's like we are reflecting the truth because the God, God's word is the truth and we're living out the truth. And when we do that, when we do that, church, we are literally invading darkness with the light. When we practice God's word, when we live it out, um, we are invading the darkness with light, which means the truth. Um, so this is 
as in some of Jesus' final words, this is what he wants for his followers, is to put his words into practice. So that we're not just a hearer of the word, but a doer, as James says it this way. So the scripture we read is recorded in Matthew, but James says it this way in the book of James. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man, like a person who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law or the perfect instruction, the word law here means teaching, into the perfect teaching that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it. He will be blessed in what he does. Amen? So church, what Jesus is getting at here is that he wants the text. He wants the text of our Bibles. Now we know it's just printed text on a page. And we know it's holy. We know it's sacred text. But the true sacredness and the true holiness is when that text is transferred from the pages of a printed book and it's transferred to our hearts. That's what God says. He's going to write His instructions and write His teachings upon our minds and upon our hearts. That's what Jesus is getting at. Not that we just have these, what we would call, static letters, static statements on paper. Just printed text on a paper that stays on the paper. He wants it transferred into our lives so that it's dynamic and it's lived out and the world sees it in us and that God gets all the glory. So in contrast, in this story, the only the contrast is you're either a wise person or you're a foolish person. It's the same storm. Okay? It's the same storm. It's the same wind. It's the same waves. It's the same flood. The only difference is, is how the house was constructed. So Jesus is drawing a contrast here. That's why it is summed up that the people says, in the end they say, his teachings are amazing because he has authority, unlike the other teachers who teach us wrongly. They were amazed at his ability to teach the word of God. Why? Because he is the living word of God. So the contrast is this, and you can see it in this, in this picture. That's why there's a cutaway. You can see the house on the left is the wise builder, and normally you cannot see it because it's also covered by the ground. But on the right side is the foolish builder. There is no truly no foundation. The foundation is actually on the sand. That is the contrast. And you see, this, this pictorial graph, this picture, shows us what a glimpse of what it looks like when you see below the surface. So in the outcome, here's the good outcome, the good result, is that when we practice God's Word, you and I have the ability to withstand the storm. Just like we've been doing in these days of persevering and persisting and having patience during COVID-19 and other difficult times in our lives. So again, look at the contrast. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. The same thing is repeated. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. And there we can see, we can see the contrast. Now in the Judean Galilee summer, when, if people would build homes in those days, uh, many people could build a home, but during that intense hot and intense heat of the summer, it would bake, it would bake the mud. Uh, in, you know, some places we have what's called an adobe, where the home is built out of mud and clay and straw. And, and, and many people could build a house during that time, but nobody knew if the house was well built. You don't know if the house is well built 
until the storm comes. It's the storm that determines how well the house is built and what the house is built on. Now, Cindy and I, years, years ago, I got the Marine Corps transferred me to another base in Texas. And it was cheaper for us to buy a home than to rent a home. So we bought a home. And after living there about two months, I noticed my neighbor doing something very strange. He would water his plants and trees, and then he would water the foundation of the house. And I had never seen this my whole life. I'm thinking, you're, and we were under water rations sometimes because of a drought. And I would say, uh, Mr. Uh, W.D., his name is W.D., I don't know what that stood for. But anyway, I said, what? why are you watering your foundation? He said, you have to water your foundation in this area because of the soil. And all this entire housing addition was built on a landfill where it used to be they would put trash and garbage and no one ever even told us when we bought the house. <laughs> so for two or three months, I did not water the foundation of the home. And sure enough, by the end of summer, half of the homes on our streets had cracks in their foundations. You see, they didn't build it well because it wasn't built well on a rock. And so many homes suffered damage because they built it on loose soil, landfill that was never properly compressed and compacted, and it didn't have any rock. And that was unfortunate because we paid a heavy price for that one. You see, church, just like the tree, the key to the fruit is the root. It's what you don't see. The key to a well-built house, or not so well-built, is what's below the surface. And for you and I, what's below the surface? Hopefully, it is the Word of God. The seeds of the Word of God that is sown into our hearts. Amen? The pastor and teacher, F.B. Meyer, said this way, to believe about, about Christ is not enough. We must believe in Him. We must come to Him because He is the living stone. The living stone with a capital uppercase. He is the living stone, meaning He's the chief cornerstone. When we build a building, we build our lives. We're being built up. The church is built upon this cornerstone. He is the living stone and you and I become the living stones. Why? Because He's the living Lord. He is the living word and he is the living stone. And I pray that you and I, you and I, that our lives are built upon this solid, solid foundation. It's never too late. There are times in our lives that we need to reflect, even myself. I need to go back and reflect. Are there areas in my foundation that needs to be examined? Are there areas in my foundation that the Lord needs to repair? We all need to be honest about that and, and come to the Lord in an honest way. So I want to echo those words one more time from Pastor R.C. Sproul. Can I make the Bible come alive? Now we know what people mean by that. They mean to teach the Bible in such a way that it's appealing, it's interesting, and I have to do this as a Bible teacher at ICS or kids can get very bored and so forth. I know what this person was asking. But R.C. Sproul, he had it right when he said, no, I cannot make the Bible come alive. The Bible has never been dead. It's never been ill. In fact, the Bible makes me come alive. Let's pray. Do you want to share? We're going to pray for these two graduates. We're very thankful to the Lord for both of them. could have the, uh, those who are nominated as deacons and also our treasurer, if you could uh, come up forward, please. As I have gotten to know each of these men, each of these men uh, love the Lord.